Yeah. So Jim, you served in Vietnam. You had an illustrious career as a coach and a referee and a teacher in school, and we'll get into all that. Uh, but I want to start out with your action happened in 1969. Mm -hmm. The award that you're wearing got put on your neck in 2017, I think. Mm -hmm. it was some math in public's hard, like 48 years. Did you know that, there, that your name was under consideration in any of those years? And kind of tell us what, what that process was to get to 2017. I'll give you a real short version that isn't short. No, it's um, in 1969, five, five, about five months after the battle, my lieutenant called me in and he said, um, Doc, I put you up for the Distinguished Service Cross for your um, actions in the battle for Nguyen Hill. But a superior officer of mine said that uh, you're nothing but a private first class and they don't get that to put you in for the Bronze Star. And I told my lieutenant, I'm not here for any medals or ribbons on my chest. I just want to go home and be a teacher and a coach and a dad. I did get that Bronze Star and I earned another one and came home and I told my father and my uncle that I'd been discriminated against because of my rank, but I was fine with it. Went on with my career. And uh, 40 years afterwards, um, after I had retired from teaching and coaching, um, I get a call from the lieutenant. This is in 2009, exactly 40 years after the action. He said, I'm going back after the Distinguished Service Cross. Took him six years, four months to get it from the Human Relations Committee into the Army Board of Decorations and Award. Finally, uh, we heard nothing for a month. And then we heard nothing for a year. So seven years into the process, we found out it was up at the Pentagon. That was in August of 2016. We found out in October, Shri and I were in a, in a restaurant. We got a call from um, someone. I didn't know who it was, so I declined him. I declined him twice. <laughs> um, and uh, so we got a call. And I said, oh, honey, they've, they've left us a message. Let's see what they want us to buy. So I put it on the table, and I hit the button, and I said, hi, Jim. This is Senator Debbie Stabenow, who was the congressperson in charge of the lieutenant's case. And, and I've been trying to get you. I left you a message at home, too. Um, the good news is your case came across the desk of Ashton Carter, our Secretary of Defense, it would have been Obama's last year, and he was uh, his Secretary of Defense. And he read, you need two eyewitness letters. Only 32 of us walked out of the battle out of 89. We went up against 2,700 enemy soldiers. And um, he had nine eyewitness letters. Wow. Five of the nine I had saved. Uh, they were five of 10 Americans that I saved and one Vietnamese interpreter. And uh, he read those and said, no, the Distinguished Service Cross not high enough. So he recommended me for the Medal of Honor. I bet you don't know this, but the Medal of Honor must be given within two years. The Navy, Cross, or Navy Medal of Honor, five years, has to be given within five years of the action. Well, it had been 47 years at that time. So they had to, Debbie Stabenow had to write a bill to be passed in the House and in the Senate, that passed December of 2016. I knew that Obama couldn't do it because he was going out as soon as Christmas was over, uh, 20th of January. And we heard nothing until we got a call from Trump on May of uh, 2017. We still had to be quiet because they didn't have a date. So the only persons that we could tell, we told my sons, because if we got in an accident or something, and, and we both were killed. Somebody on our end had to know. So two weeks later, I'm going to go golfing with a couple of, um, of my 72 assistant coaches that I had over the years. And it was five minutes to 11. I get the call from the Pentagon. And it was a colonel. And she said, Jim, in five minutes, the United States of America and the world will know that Jim McLuhan is receiving the Medal of Honor on July the 31st. I said, thank you very much, uh, Colonel Walters. And I hung up and I called Sheree and I said, hey, watch the news. I'm about to tee off. <laughs> <laughs> how'd, that, how'd that shot go? Well, well I, I tried to convince him. I'm a joker, as you all know. I tried to convince him I was getting a Medal of Honor. Sure you are. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, two of them maybe, you know. <laughs> but they called me that night. Um, just to let you know, I never talked about my service time, and I never, ever talked about that battle except with my father and my VA counselor that I did go and see later because I was done teaching and coaching and I had time on my hand and things were starting to flood back. Mm -hmm. So I went to see him. So uh, anyway, um, my son gets a call the evening of the day I received it, uh, July 31st, and uh, was his sergeant detective. He's a lieutenant detective in Michigan State Police, 31st year now. He said, Jamie, I saw your father get the medal from President Trump on TV today. When did you first hear this story? And my son said, today, the same time you did. So oh, wow. I, that's the first I heard of the, or heard the citation because that was drawn off of the nine eyewitness letters. But that's now, the story. You mentioned your father and, uh, yeah. You mentioned your father, and I think your father kind of flashed into your head during the battle, if I, if I recall correctly. What was that all about, and how did that transpire? Well, the first, the first day, I uh, went into the kill zone five times, and I was wounded with rocket-propelled uh, shrapnel. Um, and so when the enemy backed off that night, and we were putting the wounded and dead on the helicopter, my lieutenant, uh, head of the company, said, get on, Doc. And that's when I realized that I'd gotten hit out there and my blood was all over me. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not going. I had gotten close enough to the hill. I was about three quarters of a mile to a mile from the hill. And when they attacked my platoon out there, they started coming towards us from the hill and it looked like lava. And as you heard me say, there were, I did, we didn't know this, 2,700 people on that hill. And so... He said, why not? And I said, you're going to need me. My father was talking in my ear. He told me at a very young age, Jim, you never do anything halfway. Do it to the best of your ability and do it till the job is done. I knew my job was not done. I felt as if I just spent my last day on earth by telling him that I wasn't going to get on. But I'd rather be dead in a rice paddy than alive in a hospital and find out that one of my men got killed because Jim McLuhan wasn't there to do his job. And by the way, our job, we do save people, but our job is really to put people back into the fight. So by staying there, me and a machine gunner who also was hit, he refused to go on. By staying there, um, we were able to save. I went into the kill zone five more times the second day, was wounded twice the second day, and here I am. You shared, you shared an amazing statistic with me just before coming up here that the expected the life expect expectancy of a medic in Vietnam was six seconds in, in a during in an ambush in yeah, an ambush because they're yeah. waiting for him to come out. They know I'm the one that can put the other guys back into the fight. So they will sometimes wound. Uh, we've got some medics. My, some of my brothers are medics uh, out there, and and they will wound somebody knowing that that medic will come out to fix him, and then they can kill the medic. Uh, also, they will call for a medic. The enemy will call for a medic. And that one Vietnamese interpreter that I saved, when I got to him and I'm in the crossfire and I looked at him, I thought I didn't recognize it was Tay right away. And I thought, oh, I've been duped. One of the enemy soldiers has called me out here. And I slid in next to him. I said, Tay, where you hit? Not hit, Doc. Very, very scared. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, hang on. You're going up on my shoulders and we're going to try to get you out of here. So that, yeah, very, very scared. <laughs> Amazing. And um, you came back and, and uh, entered into sports, and you spent decades coaching. And you've told me before, you could, you, I think you can rattle off exactly how many kids or how many teams or how many yeah. games you've, you've refed. Tell us about which sports and, and how that all, how you got into sports after the Well, match. when I first came back, I shared this with uh, someone in the other room. Um, they didn't have my job as a, when they, when they drafted me, and I was in the true draft, I wasn't in the lotto draft. Uh, 1968 was true draft. And um, I had already signed a contract to teach and coach. I was going to coach football and wrestling. And um, so when I came back, they didn't have, they had the, uh, 
they had another coaching job for me, so I had football, wrestling, and baseball to coach, but they didn't have the high school job for me, so they put me in junior high school, the seventh and eighth grade, and I told those kids that Vietnam prepared me for them. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've ever been in the middle school, you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, but I eventually then moved to the high school. Um, I had a bachelor's degree in sociology, uh, had a master's degree in, in psychology, and I actually was able to teach both of those at the high school level. So I did some college, too. My wife and I both did a little junior college uh, teaching. But I coached uh, 40 um, football teams, high school football teams, 22 wrestling teams. Then I spent 25 years as an official for wrestling. And you hope to get at least one state final. And I was very humbly chosen for 18 state finals as an official. You're in the Wrestling Hall of Fame, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I never wrestled in college. I was an all-conference basketball player in high school. You're too was, short. Huh? You're too That's short. what I told them. <laughs> and they said, are you going out for basketball? No. Well, well, in 1964, they were trying to start a wrestling team at Olivet College, which is south of Michigan State. And I had literally never seen a high school or college wrestling match. So one thing they've never let me forget was walking into the uh, wrestling practice room the first day of practice and looking around and saying, where's the ropes? I've seen this on TV, and there's <laughs> supposed to be ropes. So I thought they were recruiting for big time wrestling, but I went on to win back-to-back -back conference titles, was the first conference champion. But I coached uh, in the spring, 38 baseball teams and a summer 35 American Legion teams, if you all know what American Legion is. And um, I was blessed more than I deserve. I mean, to meet um, and be a part of those young men's lives. I've sang at a lot of their weddings and um, I've actually officiated a few uh, funerals, one for a gentleman that was one of the machine gunners. And, and uh, so I, I just was elated that I made it back and I was able to do, and by the way, my brother was the first McLuhan to graduate from college. I always said we weren't poor, my family wasn't poor, we just didn't have any money. Didn't have any running water till I was um, five years old. Well, I didn't have any running water till I was eight or nine. Didn't have any electricity till I was five. And so I always said, we, you know, we just didn't have any money, but we weren't poor. And so my mom and dad couldn't pay for our college. I had, pay, I had used every dime that I ever earned in my life to get my, my college degree and to get certified to teach. And they pulled that away from me. And at one time, before I actually got on a plane and went to Vietnam, I thought I may never get to do this. I may never get to, um, to do what I worked so hard mm. to get to. So, but I did. You did. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. So four decades of coaching and teaching, that's a lot of young people to be in front of. How did your experiences as a military person viewing leadership and leadership yourself impart lessons onto all those um, team members that you had throughout the years? Well, I didn't coach sports and I didn't teach uh, subjects. I coached people and I taught people. And um, my mission as an educator was to prepare those young people in my classroom and on the um, athletic fields or on the mats for their Vietnam. I had been prepared by my mentors growing up for what I had to face and what any veteran had to face in war. And you can't really get ready for that, but some of them really did prepare me for some of that. And their Vietnam might be not getting a class, failing a class that they really needed, not getting into the college that they wanted, the parents divorcing, maybe a girlfriend saying, yeah, I don't think we're going to get engaged. You know, we got planned, but their house burning down later on in life, uh, being downsized or whatever. I don't know what their Vietnam was going to be, but I wanted them to, I wanted to build character in them so that they could face whatever Vietnam was that they had to face. And, um, Actually, 
I said this the first day of class, and I think Sri feels the same way. I am not the only teacher in this room. You will learn something from each other. I will learn something from you, and you might even get a little bit from me. And when you look at that, that way, when you look at it for the museum, I'm telling you, I am so happy that they chose you. A man of your character to lead this uh, group and to lead this mission, you're the man. It's very kind okay. of you, thank you. You're, very, you're the man. Yeah. And, and part of that is picking the right people then to do all that. And you all out here are part of that team, a huge part of that team. Nothing could go on with the rest of the team without you. I would like to personally thank you for what you're doing for this program. So um, as, you, as you get into leadership, you really find out that if you put people, I think my success as a coach was if you put your people in the right place, you know how moms and dads think their sons should be the pitcher, but they're not, he's not a pitcher. You know, <laughs> so I'm never gonna put him in that position. I've been challenged at time and they found out, you know, but that I was really saving him too by not putting him into a position of failure. So it's, it's, um, it's a wonderful thing to just be part of it, you know? And I know you feel that way too, that, and I've never thought that I was better than anybody else. As a matter of fact, I, I told some teachers who talked down to kids, you know what, these kids are gonna grow up and they're gonna remember how you treated them and they're just another person. They might be a little bit younger than you, but um, take my word, I've learned a lot from some of these kids, mm -hmm. you know, a lot. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, I just can't even imagine how, how many students, do you have any idea how, how many students that was? It's like thousands of kids that you positively impacted their life. I, I've tried to figure that out, and I actually went back from, to 1970, the fall of 1970, and looked at the yearbooks and counted every student in the yearbooks, um, and then those that weren't pictured, okay? <laughs> Obsessive compulsive, you know? <laughs> um, and I've calculated that around 14,000 students that I, I taught and around 4,500 athletes, and that doesn't count the 22 little league baseball teams that I coached and the 13 junior wrestling programs that I was involved in. Yeah, and the men's and women's softball, I ran that for 22 years, and the park systems in the summer. Yeah. But other than that, I had no relationship with, with sports whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with the help of the people here and our staff, we're going to help you make that number by, grow by 10x or 20x or oh. 50x and really impact, impact those same exact lessons of character and the things that you're talking about to the whole country. So thank you all for helping us do that. A round of applause for all of us. You know, I have a stat, and I think probably a lot of people know this. Coaches have all kinds of stats, but this is about the... the uh, amount of people in our population in America who are in uniform right now. And it's just a little over one half of 1%. That means that 99.5% have to keep alive the um, veteran stories, those who died to, to, to preserve our American values. We have quite a job because they're not teaching a lot of that in the schools anymore. Um, I just spoke at a high school uh, at a, a veterans program, and those kids were very enthusiastic, but Veterans Day is not one day out of the year. Um, I will challenge you, whether it's someone in your family, somebody you know, you know, so no, no longer is the, the kid down the street, you know, that just graduated two or three years ago wearing uniform and coming home. So keep alive, keep alive your family or your friends or just acquaintances stories. Because a man is not dead or a woman is not dead until their name is no longer spoken. That's what memorial walls are all about. People come and they read those names and they continue to keep the spirit of that person alive. We need to get those stories down and then you'll be able to um, 
they'll be able to know where their freedom came from. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. Um, shifting gears, you have this amazing ability to sing. And I don't know if everybody in this audience knows that, but you've sang at events and sporting events and national anthems. Where did that passion for music come from? Well, my mom wanted me to go into music and um, I went to a one room country school, kindergarten through the sixth grade. There was kindergarten through eighth grade in one room. My brothers and I walked to school one mile every day and walked home uphill in the snow. <laughs> But um, so it wasn't until a little while later in junior high that I went into the high school. So what did you want me to come? Singing. Oh, yeah, that's right. I started that when I was like four years old at the church. So that was the first time I performed. I can't remember the song, but I think it was something like Amazing Grace or Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. That one. That one's my first. Okay. Oh. <laughs> but I, I, I'm a Glenn Campbell. I don't know what you know about Glenn Campbell, but I can't read music. I read by position. So if someone wants something at a funeral, at a big event, uh, I've sang at a lot of my athletes' uh, weddings. And if they have a song that I've never known before, I will get the artist uh, record or tape or whatever you can get now, or get it on YouTube, play it, then I will buy the uh, backup music and do it at the event. But um, yeah, I, I was a music major f for the first year at Olivet College, and they came to me and said, if you're going to remain a music major, you have to learn two instruments. And I said, well, I don't play the radio real well, so this may not work out. <laughs> So I went from that, and, and I was in barbershop quartets. I had a lot of solo work, um, uh, of course, doing things at events and at churches, sang all over in churches. And, and I've sang over, I've sang at the National Rodeo Finals a couple times, the Falcon game, the, um, gosh, the Tampa Bay Lightning game, uh, all over. And then... Any of those an, been the most memorable for you? Me or meaningful, I should um, say. No, not really. I, I think the most meaningful was when I, when I would officiate or I was a coach at an event and they said, hey, we, you know, we've got, a, a, we've got the national anthem on tape or whatever it was at the time. You know, it's not tape anymore, but we'd like you to do it if you would do it. And interesting story now that we're talking about music. So 1991, the principal came down to my room. And he said, Jim, I was the announcer for the basketball games because I'd played basketball and they liked the way I announced, so that's fine. After the national anthem tonight, would you sing Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA? I said, well, I've never sang it in public yet. I know it. Well, would you do it? I said, well, what's up? We went to war today. That's when we went to Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. And so I did. I sang it that night. And the guy that was going to do the conference wrestling tournament on Saturday came up to me and said, hey, will you do that at the tournament, uh, the wrestling tournament on Saturday? And I said, sure. So at the wrestling tournament on Saturday, the guy's going to do the team district that my team was going to be. Will you do that for the team district? <laughs> I'll make a story short. Then I did it for the individual district, the team regional, the individual regional, and then I sang it five times at the state finals that year. And um, Sheree and I were lucky to meet Lee Greenwood, and I actually have sang on stage uh, that song on stage with Lee Greenwood. But I want to share, can I share something about that song? Absolutely. Lee Greenwood, after he got, we got done singing, he, he, and by the way, he's, he's shorter than me. He's right about here. You think he's a giant man because he's, he can sing like a giant man. He said, you know, Jim, I don't write or sing anything without meaning behind it. No, I, I believe that. He says, um, for instance, if tomorrow all the things were gone, I worked for all my life, and I had to get, start again with my children and my wife, that's about his grandparents who lost their farm and had to start all over. He quit school. I didn't know this. At age 16, went up to Alaska, and he figured, well, maybe, you know, he need, his 
fan wanted to get a little bit of confidence. They didn't have a lot of confidence. I think they made it, don't you? Um, anyway, he went up there, and these two guys took him under their wings and got him some small gigs and then some larger ones and then some big ones. And those two men went to Vietnam, and they were killed in Vietnam. I won't forget the men who died who have given oh, wow. this right to me. Wow. Wow. So, so I, I love songs with meaning too. I like the I like the music part of it, but I really the words are something that I usually concentrate on on doing. Wow. Yeah. That's so impactful. Um, we want to give the audience a chance to ask ask questions, but I got a, a very lighthearted one for you to, before we do that. Being from Michigan, did you steal signs when you were in a coach in high school? <laughs> Yes, I did. That's why I say, <laughs> that's why I say, if your signs are getting stolen, you don't have any signs. <laughs> that's what I say. Yeah. And, and as a matter of fact, in that sign stealing thing, you know, there were other, about, what, 9,000 or 10,000 people looking at the same guys. Maybe they did it. I don't know. <laughs> but whatever. I, I, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a situation where I had a, I had what's called an indicator. So I can be given all different kinds of signs, you know, from the third base coaching box. But until I touched my number 10 for my jersey here, then the next sign is the one that they're looking for. Then I'll continue to give a bunch of others so they don't know I've already given it. Okay. So one of my ex-players went to uh, student teach at one of these conference schools. And he told their coach all about my signs and how when I touched, I discovered that he was doing it, so I changed my indicator. Uh -huh. So we had a, we had a <laughs> two, and, two and two count on one of our batters, and I gave the steal after this, but I gave the take after this. This was my new sign, I grabbed my, okay? He stole the guy and threw outside, and we had another ball. We now had three balls on us, and he walked us. <laughs> but I realized, and I didn't know, though, that one of my players that had been one of his student teachers and had chatted with him about my signs. Mm -hmm. But I changed, that's all you got to do, change your sign. Well, I'd love to open and, it up to, to the audience for questions, so um, please fire away. I think we do have a microphone because we, we are recording. Let's so. don't use fire away, okay? <laughs> Good point. We got a medic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might be dead <laughs> six seconds. <laughs> no brave souls? Yes, sir. So oh, we've got a microphone. Just because we're recording it, it's helpful. Thank you. So people tend to react differently and respond differently to fear. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in your job, Obviously, you had to react in a certain way to get certain results. How, how did you interpret fear? And then what was your why behind still pushing through fear? Good question. Um, first of all, I give uh, all sports, but man, particularly football and wrestling, which are combative sports, um, I give them credit for saving my life and allowing me to save a lot of other lives. And I'm not talking about the physical part, that's good, but I'm talking about the mental part that it taught me to focus on whatever it was I had to do. You go back to my dad telling me, don't do anything halfway, do it to the best of your ability. So w what I know about my brothers out here with this metal on, you concentrate on the other person. So I concentrated on what I needed to do and focused on what I had to do to get this guy out of the kill zone, get him patched up, get him back into the fight. I think that if we did that in life, if we, so many times we think about our problems, and if we look at somebody else's, we'd see how small our problems are. And so I looked at the, he was in worse shape than I was, I hadn't been hit yet, yet, I'll say that, but, um, but that's what I needed to do, focus on what it was to, to uh, take care of him. And, and you're, if people that say they're not afraid or there's no fear in the area, I think they're either lying or crazy. They're, we had some crazy guys too, and I 
wondered if they were fearful or not. But, um, but yeah, um, and I know that uh, fear comes to us quite often um, in our real life. And when Sheree and I might be having something that's uh, uh, financial or whatever, I'll remind her that nobody's shooting at us. So kind of put it into perspective, so to speak. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Oh, there we go, Mayor. Thank you. Jim, thank you for who you are, and thank you for what you did to receive the medal, but what you're doing afterwards. But something that really made an impression on me, could you talk about the importance of this museum and the Leadership Institute and what it's going to mean to the Medal of Honor recipients, and then, of course, what it's going to mean to America? Oh, yes. I sure will. I'm going to go back to what I said a little bit earlier, that um, 99 point five percent of us this is going to impact a lot of people and the area that you're in and I can remember back I was just first coming into the society when it was going to be Denver is it going to be mm -hmm. you and you have an ideal spot of course for one thing but to teach kids and I by the way I'm the chairman of our character development program but I was teaching character development in psychology and those other play and on the baseball field football field and wrestling mats uh, along the way. Um, kids have to have a tool. You know, they're going to have to make their own decisions. But if you give them a tool about courage, you know, patriotism, sacrifice, if you give them those values, then when they come across something, they have something to gauge, should I do this? or shouldn't I? Do I really want to go over there or don't I? And I also tell kids that Jesus didn't pick the 12 greatest people in the world, you know, to be a part of his fishers of men, but he turned, so if you can turn somebody into your thoughts, along with the, um, the six um, core values that we have, I add two more ingredients to those to make them fruitful. One is your thinking. I tell kids the things that you think and then the things that you make a habit of will govern how successful you are in applying those to your character. So that boy that shot the president, he didn't think about that that morning. He thought that about that for a long time. And if he would have been thinking in another direction towards something more positive, that would have never happened. And I happen to know, and you happen to know, everybody happens to know somebody that has a deep habitual problem. Once they get that habit, it has them. You think in a certain way, and by the way, we speak at 125 words a minute. We think 525 words a minute. If you don't think what you think is very valuable, think about that. And while you're listening to me, you're thinking at a, somewhere in a, a range of 1,000 words a minute. Really, you are that smart, okay? <laughs> <laughs> don't cut yourself short. Yeah. But uh, this, this, this is terrific. I mean, and the people that have already, and I look over at, uh, at Britt and, and uh, Christina, and, and Christi I've never seen anybody so organized in my life as she is, but, <laughs> but uh, we count on her to, okay, what do we do next, to, you know? Go get something to eat, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but the people that, that you, you choose, I would never make a person be my defensive coordinator if he was good at offense. He'd be my offensive coordinator. And one of the, the greatest things are, is the people that you choose, and we're getting back to putting them in the right positions and then having faith in them. I have faith that this is going to be one of the biggest things that's ever happened to young kids, to older people, to those who don't know anything about the Medal of Honor, and you know we run into that a lot. Um, do you know what this is? No, I don't know what that is. People that have been in the service for a long, long time. 
So the way that people are placed and, and, and the way that you work hard and, and by reaching into your pocket and saying, you know, if I give 100,000, whatever you want to give, that's going to make this, this place a phenomenal place, uh, just a phenomenal place. And I'll tell you, one of my wishes is that in some small community someplace, somebody else will get a museum. I want it so that kids will only have a few miles to walk to a museum because this isn't all about us either. This is about the people we fought next to. This is about that guy that when he was killed in action, Reagan put it best, he gave up two lives. He gave up the life he was leading when he was killed. And he gave up the life he never got to lead. Never got to meet his soulmate and marry. Never got to see the birth of a child. Never got to play ball with that child and coach my two boys. I got to coach my two boys in a couple of sports. Never got to walk their little girl down the aisle and dance that father-daughter dance at the ceremony after the wedding. And every holiday, every Veterans Day, every anniversary, every birthday, and every reunion, they're not there. They gave up two lives so that you and I can live the one life that we so, so amazingly get to live. What? Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Um, for, you know, oh, don't call me, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, you know, you speak so profoundly about the lessons is, that you've imparted on um, the youth. Mm -hmm. And the, what I, I think the rest of us can see are lucky folks that have been able to cross your path. I would ask you, how old were you when you were actually in the service and, you know, uh, uh, like you said, le leaned in, in in difficult times? Mm -hmm. I, was, I was drafted in the um, August of 1968, was 22, college graduate. I turned 23 the month before the battle. I turned uh, 23 April 30th, 69. And when I came home, I was 24 when I came home. Um, but um, I was just a few months older than my company commander. We had, uh, I, I held 18, 19 and 20 year old boys in my arms, and I, I heard their last words, and I heard and saw the last breath of life come out of their body. I can, I can attest to the fact that, that the freedom that we enjoy daily has been paid for mm. in full. In full. Wow. Um, one thought that just came into my head, was, was there a Coach McLuhan in your life? Oh, yeah. Who, who was that? I know your dad was very impactful, but who were the mentors that got, made you the person that was able to do that job when you were 23 years old? Mm -hmm. Well, a bunch of people did, by the way, and it takes a community. I, I was, it takes a community to raise a child, you know. Well, I was in a small community, community and I tell kids when I speak it in, in small towns or small high schools, Someday you will realize how lucky you were to grow up in small town USA. Because I, I didn't tell some lady who corrected me on something, hey, you ain't my mom, you know. <laughs> she would probably slap me. I, I never said it, so I don't know if she would have or not. But So I had a bunch of people. I had a high school um, uh, football coach, and he's still alive. And my college wrestling coach, who's passed away, and I sang at his uh, and spoke at his funeral. Um, they were the most impactful, and I'll just give you, a, I'll give you one little thing that happened to me. I was the captain my senior year of the uh, wrestling team, and so a lot of times he would call me to his house and get together. Okay, we need to do this and this and this and this. You know, I want you to be on board. So we were going up against the school that had the returning national junior college 130 pound national champion. I knew he had gone down to 130, 
he'd gone down to 125 from 130. So my weight class was 130. And I'm trying, well, I played football that year at 165. Oh, so um, I was trying to get down and I had hit rock bottom. And he calls me and I figured he wants to talk to me about something to get ready for, you know, the next meet or whatever. And I walked in and I had had nothing for two days, okay? I had nothing for two days in the battle, so I always say, I knew how to do that because I had done that at one time. Mm -hmm. um, I walked past this glass of water and boy, that looked good. <laughs> and I walked into his den, he was sitting there and I'm waiting for him to tell me what it is he wants to talk to me about. He says, when's the last time you had anything to eat or drink? I didn't lie to him. I, I would never lie to my coach or my dad or anybody that was my superior. I said, it's been two days, sir. I want to get down to 25 so I can wrestle uh, Paul Betts. He said, well, I'm going to tell you. See that water in there? You're going to drink it. And then I'm going to fill it up again, and you're going to drink it again. Luckily, Paul Betts was at 1.30 that weekend, uh. and I tied him. And that tie was one of the best matches I ever wrestled. Don't say that you always have to win to feel great because I tied the national champion in a sport I hadn't started to compete in until I was a freshman in college. So I thought I had him pinned. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're here tonight, you're part of our team, you're part of our tribe, and you're part of our community, and you know how important it is to share these stories with America. And it, this last hour, how evident is of that, that this is really going to be important for our youth to hear and the future of our country. Uh, we want to say, uh, um, on behalf of our entire staff and our board of directors and the whole museum, we work for you guys and, and all the recipients in, in the room, probably missing some. We're, we're honored to be uh, on your team and deliver this product to the country. In five months, we'll open the door, and we can't wait to have you be there. And thank you to all of you for could, being here tonight. Could I get? Could, could Can we, we get all of them? We get up? all the Medal of Honor recipients. Yeah, that's a great idea. Stand up, all the Medal of Honor recipients. Please stand up. Stand up. Good idea. <laughs>